Hello, everyone, and welcome to Cloud Wars Live, where we explore today's digital revolution by speaking with business executives and thought leaders who are changing how the world lives, works, plays, learns, and dreams. Our guest today is special monthly contributor, Tony Uphoff, CEO of Thomas. Tony's got his own podcast just kicking into gear, and we're going to talk with him a little bit about that. But overall, one of the things that Tony, in his monthly role of Uphoff on industry, is bringing to us is from the industrial sector some thoughts on how the whole sector is trying to bring some automation to some of the processes more intelligence more awareness and also the growing sophistication of buyers and how much they know about the companies they are buying from before any transaction ever happens and it's an interesting dynamic isn't it tony about how that you know tinkers with the buyer seller equation Boy, it does, Bob. First off, great to see you. And, and if you don't mind my taking a second, I, I uh, for your audience in particular, I just want to acknowledge the passing of Mark Hurd, um, co-CEO of Oracle, gone way too soon. For those of us, I wouldn't say I got to know him particularly well, but <clears throat> I was on the receiving end of some of uh, Mr. Hurd's uh, administrations uh, as a member of the media at times, and he could be a, a tough guy, but I huge admiration for his business acumen and, and the work that he did. So just wanted to acknowledge that. I'm sure most of your listeners are very well aware of his uh, untimely passing. Tony, yeah, thanks for mentioning that. I thought uh, Larry Ellison offered a very personal and uh, very, very, um, very, very personal touching uh, remarks about Mark. And I think, as you said, uh, you know, he was a, a disciplined executive, but uh, uh, also just, just far, far too soon for somebody. And, uh, you know, we sure wish all the best to his wife and his daughters. Yes. Yeah. Period. Thanks for mentioning that, Tony. Yeah. So, Pal, first, you've been busy, and I think one thing that is a great uh, little sign you have on the whiteboard there above your head, so thank you. Uh, I think for the, uh, the, the ad rates you charged us for that placement, I, you know, it could be a little bigger, but, you know, yeah, I, you know. Yeah, we'll work on that. We'll work That's on right. that. That's right, yeah. But, Tony, tell us about this thing. I know we, we, we chatted about it a little bit last time, but it really seems like the manufacturing sectors, the industrial sectors are really trying to get more advanced, more automated, more intelligence into some of these processes that have been purely manual for decades or even centuries. Yeah, I think what's happening, and, and it really is amazing to watch it play out, Bob, is if you think about the U.S. manufacturing industry, which is really, it's the largest $2.3 trillion industry. It's a proxy for the rest of the world. Um, what's happened over the last 40 to 50 years is a remarkable series of technical revolutions, if not evolutions in U.S. manufacturing. So the obvious things we know about today of robotics and advanced manufacturing, that just continues to accelerate. We're starting to see some really very cool technology around what they're calling smart warehousing, where they're combining man plus machine to automate these warehouses and improve efficiencies. It's just amazing to see what's going on out there. What has happened and um, is accelerating over the last probably seven to eight years is this digital transformation of industrial sales, marketing, and supply chain management. And you and I have touched on that in previous uh, episodes. <clears throat> it is particularly fascinating in this part of the marketplace because without sounding pejorative, U.S. manufacturing and the industrial markets were late adopters to the digital transformation of sales, marketing, and supply chain management. So a simple metric that is becoming increasingly powerful is that the average industrial sale today um, the purchase process is 70 plus percent of the way through before a buyer engages with a sales rep. So that's the, probably the ultimate you know, manifestation of what you and I are talking about here. So <clears throat> as companies are starting to adapt to this, two gaps are appearing, Bob. So one is the obvious gap between those that adopt and those that don't. History teaches us that companies that adopt these new digital technologies can accelerate away from competitors. But the bigger challenge for a lot of uh, companies that we work with and that we're seeing in the marketplace is the gap between that company's customers and the company itself. And that's you know, something that's proving to be even more tricky is how do I understand where my prospect is or my customer is if I'm not yet talking to them yet? And how does that work in today's world? 
Honey, it's a, it's, a, it's a detail ish question here, but who's going to be the agent of change within these companies? Is this, does it have to come from the CEO? Is it the chief revenue officer? You know, who's going to trigger this? It, it's a fantastic question. What we're finding is it, um, and I'm going to generalize here, it, it is most often somebody with technical acumen. So you would think this would come from somebody who owns the point of pain, maybe a head of sales or um, a head of marketing or whatever. What we're finding almost time and time again is somebody with some reasonable technical acumen who can see this shift, but then can start to vet through the series of either data and analytics platforms or systems or approaches and is not intimidated by them. You know, you and I have seen through cycles of technology before, it's actually fascinating, and, and I'll say fascinating in quotes here, it's fascinating to watch successful business people confronted with something they completely don't understand and don't have any experience with. And so you tend to see two different things. You know, some just put their head in the sand and they think, you know, I'm just gonna hope this goes away. Others start a self-education and or they bring somebody in. But <clears throat> again, generalizing here, what we see in a lot of cases is this will be somebody with a technical title. It's somebody that has, um, it could be somebody that implemented the ERP system. It could have been, it could be somebody who's got an operational role that is automating a factory and then is taking some of that technical knowledge and discipline and starting to realize, uh-oh, the front office now is going through a, a level of automation or digital transformation. And can I apply some of the same sort of logic or, or process orientation to evaluate how best to handle that? Yeah, Tony, you know, it's interesting too, as I, I think about once that, uh, once that door is opened into these, this sort of automation and in a lot of ways, business process innovation, that it really can, can trigger some incredible improvements. And Early this year, I got to sit in on uh, SAP was having a customer advisory board meeting and they had about 60 or 70 clients, maybe a third or half of them were from industrial sector. And one of the questions was, hey, you know, after years of sort of static software capabilities brought through the on-premises model, now here with the cloud, they said, we're able to update, we're able to innovate. We started off doing that twice a year, then it was quarterly, and now they're dropping you know, some additional capabilities even more frequently. And the question from SAP to its customers was, is this pace of innovation okay with you? Are we going too fast? Do you want it to ease back? And pretty much without exception, the customers said, whatever you do, don't slow down. You know, it's, it's making life kind of uncomfortable for us, and this is a hard adjustment. But we realize that the alternative of, you know, sitting back, getting comfortable again is ultimately going to be disastrous for us. So does that tie in with what you're seeing? It, it, it absolutely does, Bob. You know, I, I shared with you before, I, I earlier this week was uh, honored to be asked to, to give a keynote address at the Electronic Component Industry Association. So 600 plus very senior executives, uh, electronic manufacturers and electronic distributors. And a lot of what you and I talk about was a part of my data and research and analysis. And I had, I'll, I'll leave names out, but I had um, the CEO of a multi-billion dollar semiconductor company come up to me as soon as I got off stage and to say, these are things that we have to confront. These are issues that we have to deal with and the sense of urgency and the pace of change we have to adapt to because we're not doing a great job of it. Um, I had uh, a, a multi-billion dollar electronics uh, distributor come up to me and echo very similar sentiments. So I think I would agree with the overall statement that even, you know, at one point somebody uh, used the expression, you punched us right in the face with the reality of where our buyer's going, mm -hmm. even if we didn't want to hear it. And, and I, I thought it was a great way of, of articulating it. Um, I think smart uh, business people always confront truth. And I think we're in an era where we can be confronted with truth um, through the data. And you know the, the days of kind of, well, if we don't see it, we don't have to react to it are really over. And I think increasingly what's happening is a lot of companies and manufacturing would be a good example of that. They're really becoming um, 
reliant on this pace of change of the technology and, and what more importantly the technology is enabling them to be able to do. And I think part of this gets into the whole data and, and how to spot patterns in data. And I think, um, again, I don't want to overgeneralize, segments of the manufacturing industry are very, very advanced at this. And, and probably the upper end of SAP's uh, customer base would reflect that. But boy, there's a long, long tail here of companies, particularly in the mid-market, that supply an enormous chunk of the, the global manufacturing economy that I think are, are a little slower in, in adopting some of the techniques. Tony, I, I'd like to just raise two points based on what you just said and get your reaction. The first is um, those notions of uh, where you said, you know, there's some companies doing a phenomenal job, but some of them sort of in the middle are, are struggling with this a little. And it seems like today these industrial platforms are almost like mini networks of companies. You're in somebody else's supply chain. It seems like there's less and less tolerance for being out of phase with these new developments, right? That would just encourage companies, you know, we got to get on this faster pace of innovation here. Yeah. And, this, and the second point Tony I wanted to ask about was from the buyer side, I think part of what you had talked about with that group there is that you don't have an alternative, right? Because your customers are getting to be so smart, so intelligent, and that 70% point you made earlier, you better bring, uh, you know, your A plus game when you finally do connect with the customers because they're going to know more about you than some of your salespeople do. Yeah, I think you're touching on something that's critical for everybody to understand. And we're just fortunate that we're kind of watching this Petri dish of, of data that we're watching this industry, you know, adapt to the, the changing nature of things. The first thing I'd touch on is this sense of, of um, the pace, but also I, I'd link it, Bob, to the sense of urgency. So one of the, the bits of research we do all the time, you know, we've got a million and a half users of ThomasNet every month that source products or select suppliers on the platform. About a million of those are registered. So we're constantly doing surveys of what the buyer's looking for. And every time we do the survey, Bob, the sense of urgency goes up. And what I really mean by that is their expectations of response time. Mm -hmm. If they engage with you, they expect you to respond to them in less than 24 hours. Now, in some industries, that seems absurd. Well, of course, you'd respond within 24 hours. But imagine you're a custom manufacturer. What you're actually offering is very complex. Sales cycles could be as long as 18 months. But now the buyer's expecting you to respond within hours when they, when they make a request. So that sense of urgency, I, I think, has gone up. And that's one of those gaps where I think the customer and buyer are moving in a direction that the supplier hasn't completely gotten in rhythm on. And, and I think that's, a, that's a, um, an increasing challenge. And, and I think, you know, one that, that uh, companies are, are trying to adapt to. The second part of your question is, is to me, equally, you know, powerful and, and really, really interesting. One of the statements I made that got a lot of resonance at the, the conference is I made the statement based on the data that today, your prospective customer knows more about your products, your offering, your competitors, their offering, and the marketplace than your best sales rep could ever know. Just think of the data sources that the buyer has control of now and what they can look at. They can talk to other buyers. They can do all kinds of different things. You're never going to know that. And so I think that's another side of this, the sense of urgency and the, and, you know, um, the speed of response because we're setting those expectations to be quicker uh, and more direct. But I think there's also this, so how do I interact with these people today? And what adds value if they're starting to make these decisions without having to talk to me and they're pretty far down the road? So complicated times, I think the, the true north, if you will, is the use of the data and analytics that can help you understand who a buyer is, what they're looking for, and where they might be in the process before you engage with them, which shifts it from the old cold call to a warm call. So, Tony, before we go on to our, our final point here, I wanted to acknowledge something that uh, you have been a busy guy lately here as CEO of Thomas at the point, uh, you know, with Thomas at the sort of the uh, pivot point between the buyers, the sellers, and the incredibly important businesses. So, 
within the last handful of months, you've spoken at the White House, you were the keynote at this conference, and you were recently on Fox Business News, right? I was, yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting. I think, you know, Bob, an undercurrent in every time we talk is the power of data, right? And, and I think what's happened, and we've been very fortunate, is um, the world has discovered that we have this remarkable, um, you know, flywheel that spins off all of this, you know, incredibly powerful data that gives a perspective of what's happening in the manufacturing economy. And I think we've gotten a bit better, Bob, at our own understanding of data and analytics so that we can draw some analysis. And so that's gotten attention from the government in a positive way, from customers, from industry groups and others. And it was fascinating experience. Uh, I shared a little bit with you before we went on air. We were very pleased to get asked by Fox Business News to come on and talk about basically the state of, of uh, U.S. manufacturing. And it was scheduled along with Manufacturing Day here in the United States. Well, the height of irony, and it was just the you know, consideration of scheduling, the day before I appeared, uh, the market had tanked by 500 points, the stock market based on uh, a, a, a procurement survey done by a trade association called ISM. So it was a fascinating time to go on to the, the show because obviously markets were reacting and things like that. Um, linking it to data, the fascinating thing about it that I brought up on the, on the program the ISM survey is a trade association and it was structured in 1948, Bob, and it surveys 300 procurement professionals and attempts to uplift this to the $2.3 trillion US manufacturing economy. So one suggests it's a rather fragile uh, and inaccurate barometer or research methodology. And so I was able to share other data from other more uh, in-depth survey samples that reflect the health and what's actually going on in, in much of the industrial economy. But great experience for us too. Tony, if I may inject a personal thought here, it wasn't ISM, but, uh, and it wasn't quite back as far as 1948, but you know, getting back there a ways. The first uh, job interview I had for a journalism job in New York City, uh, the editor of the publication that I was hoping to land a job with called Electronic News, the editor, gave me a press release put out by a group that he called uh, NAPM, the National Association of Purchasing Management. And he handed me this press release and he said, ah, he, think I, he said, I think at best it's semi-literate. If you can turn around and make it literate, you got a shot here. So, uh, <laughs> you know, the, these, but the buyers and sellers, you don't know, understand what's coming, where's that headed, where is this stuff all gonna lead to? Tony, please touch on a couple of the other things that you felt were huge factors in this globalization and also the multi-generational workforce. So as all these other changes you've described are going on, you've got these two equally profound uh, dynamics also forcing a lot of uh, disruption and I hope, you know, progress in the field. Yeah, I, I think, Bob, you know, that's one of the things that as we interact in and around the marketplace, it's really clear that there are three main drivers right now. So the first we've touched on and, and, and detailed is this idea of the digital transformation, but a vertical digital market transformation, right? Meaning in the industrial and manufacturing markets, sales, marketing, and supply chain management are going through a digital transformation. The second is globalization. And while that's not a new thing, it's clearly linked to the first. Right. So as technology has got everything now wired together and the ability to communicate, globalization takes on a very different tack here because I have new competitors. I have uh, potentially new customers. I'm now dealing with global tariffs and regulatory issues that are incredibly complex to manage and talk about something that's not completely clear and exactly what's going to transpire and those kinds of things. So that's adding to it. And then this third piece, Bob, is something we've touched on before, but we actually think this is a bigger issue than most people are realizing and not, not a negative issue. None of these are particular, uh, particularly negative. You just have to understand them to, to harness them. And that's the idea of the multi-generational workforce today. The reason this is so important and unique in this particular period of time, Bob, as you and I know, um, demographers define the largest generation ever created as the baby boom generation. So post-war, it, it, remarkable, it was the largest in size. So therefore it became the generation that set all of the demographic standards that we still use today, 
in 2017, a generation of equal size, never happened before, obviously, the millennial generation was now in the workforce at the exact same time. So the demographic stretch we have in the workforce, right, is broader than it's ever been. But also the diversity by age as a result of that is more, um, more varied than it's ever been. So what this means today is that not just your company, right, your customer is, is evolving and changing. And so if, you know, digital natives are 50% of your customer base, that carries an implication that's very different, right? So one of the data, I'll give you an interesting example. One of the data elements that we track very carefully is engagement across our platform. We still see a healthy use of phone. So people will evaluate a product or a service and then they'll reach out on phone. It, it is as much as 70% of the engagement methodology that we see when used on the platform. It's not trending up though, right? It's, it's hovered at 50% and it's starting to go down a little bit and we're seeing higher engagement through the digital tools like RFIs and other systems that we provide the market. Can I say that's the influence of the millennial generation? I honestly can't tell. The only thing we can see is a, is a substantive difference is the millennial generation, if they can't find it on your website, and these are professional buyers, these aren't consumers. If they can't find it on your website, they're gonna go find it somewhere else. You know, the odds that they're gonna call you and say, gee, Bob, you know, I, I'm looking for a flange that has these types of dynamics to it, and I'm looking for a company to build this in, in units of a thousand. If they don't see that capability on your website, they're probably gonna go find somebody that has it on ThomasNet or some other resource, as opposed to pick up the phone and call. Tony, it's wild, you know, uh, outside of the industrial sector, but this is uh, in the life insurance business, there's um, uh, a big life insurance company based in New York, Guardian Life Insurance. Sure. They were founded before the Civil War. And uh, an executive they brought in to really help modernize not only some of the technology, but the underlying business processes there. He was working with the team on its website. And the, the first part of this sort of presentation that they gave to him was saying, okay, here's a lot of our competitors' websites and here's what we do. And he said, you know, this is interesting, but it's not that valuable because we're not competing on the website with other life insurance companies. We're competing with the last digital experience that the consumer had. Because if they come to our website and they don't think that they're that impressed, they're not gonna say, well, you know, in the sphere of life insurance companies, this isn't that good, but uh, you know, it's not, I, I need to plow forward because this is what I'm doing. They said, no, that guy's gone. Th those consumers, he or she is gonna go to another place where they feel more comfortable, more that the website and the web experience represents the type of interaction they'd want to have with this life insurance company. So from the, the, the phone usage trend that you saw there, I think those are powerful, Tony. And it all seems to tie back to a great point you made early on, which is that the leaders have to recognize the truth of what's happening here, right? These, these trends are, whether it's the globalization, the move toward automation and supply chain, the uh, multi-generational dynamics and how what impact that has it seems that your points too from other discussions about it isn't so much change management it's like you know change is a constant it's a reality how do you roll with it how do you try to optimize it uh, rather than just trying to manage it yeah I think time. I think you're right Bob and I, I think the, the you had referenced supply chains before and <clears throat> as most of your listeners would know Supply chains are incredibly powerful. I mean, I could make the argument that your supply chain is your business today. And what is shifting and changing is it's almost binary. If I'm looking for new supply chain partners and they don't have the digital capabilities to connect with me and manage our communication and our business together digitally, that, that literally may be a non-starter. And, and so I think that as this starts to happen, it's not just the have and have nots, and, and it's as simple as that. There's gonna be entire access to markets that are gonna get blocked if you're not actively participating. So Tony, some uh, big implications to a lot of what you've described here today. Do you have a, a final thought or a, you know, can you pull this together with some 
counsel for everyone? Um, I, I think a couple of things, and, and you and I have touched on these things, Bob, uh, before. What, what I always really espouse to people is, you know, if someone's listening to you and I, we can get pretty geeked out about the impact of technology, and, and our common bond is around the impact of technology in business and ultimately on society. And, and we've, we've long been students of this, and we've had a ringside seat over 20 plus years to, to witness this. I think what can oftentimes happen is it can feel very intimidating, and particularly for business people that perhaps you know, have been in industries where they didn't have to do some of the adoption of advanced technologies the way you and I are describing them. It can feel like, boy, I, I, I just am really nervous to step into it. So, so a couple of things I always try to counsel is cheaper, faster, better. The technology is easier to use today. It's more accessible commercially. Um, and, and it is um, uh, easier, I wouldn't say easy, to work with than it's ever been, and that keeps progressing every year. And so I think the horror stories that you hear from 10 or 15 years ago that somebody bet the future of a company around a flawed technology implementation in some of the areas you and I are talking about, you don't hear those stories as much anymore because the technology has gotten more agile, more flexible, easier to access. So. I, I kind of try to counsel people, don't, don't be frightened, get in. Uh, I think the secondary thing goes back to something that you touched on early, Bob, around the idea of who is it in these companies. I think an investment in addition to the technology is talent. Um, one of the skills shortages in US manufacturing is really around the skills of understanding how to deal with the digital sales, marketing, and supply chain that we're dealing with today. And those are different skills, Bob, than they would be of understanding how to set up a CNC machine and advanced robotics. You know, I, I would have no business participating in something like that. Um, I'd have a lot of understanding of how to deal with that from a digital marketing and supply chain point of view, because that's my area of expertise. So that's the second thing. Hey, it's not as complicated as you might think. The second thing is don't scrimp on the talent. You know, hire somebody and put them in charge of this who can start to bring this stuff into your company. The third is, boy, there are so many resources today, you know, peer groups, you know, conferences, events, uh, resources, you know, ranging from thomasnet.com to other things that people can turn to, to find practical, actionable information to start taking the steps uh, around this stuff. So I think from the, hey, dive in, the water's not as cold as it looks. Uh, you know, don't be afraid to hire, you know, uh, the right kind of talent and, you know, be thoughtful about where there could be some resources, perhaps that you're already engaged with that might be able to present, um, to, to give you a sense of perspective or give you a bit of a guide. And, and those are, I know those sound uh, obvious, but I think for a lot of industries, those are the things that hold people back. Yeah, the, Tony, and I think they're those things that are obvious once the leading companies start to do them. But uh, before that happens, it's an opportunity for everyone. And Tony, as we close, I'd like to offer a suggestion for next time and also uh, ask you for some information. The suggestion is maybe next time as you're talking here about talent, I heard uh, recently that I think it's either 2019 or it will happen in, two, in 2020, that the, in the US, the big car companies will hire, I think it'll be three times more software engineers than mechanical engineers. So just an astonishing shift. So if that works out next time, maybe we could chat a little bit more about your sense of talent, talent gaps, talent opportunities in the industrial sector. And the quite, and, oh, please go ahead, Tom. Well, I just, just one second on that, Bob, you're, you're spot on. Would love to unpack that with you. Last year, we created 284,000 jobs in US manufacturing. Employment levels are at 1948 levels. Now, somebody asked me, gee, are these blue collar jobs or white collar jobs? And I've shared this with you before. It's the wrong question because they're new collar jobs. Most of them are high tech. They're different jobs than, you know, it is programming a CNC machine. It is um, managing a robotics operation. It is, you know, so a lot of these are different jobs. So it's not just that we're creating new jobs. That's all well and good. But you're, you're noting a subtlety here, Bob, that the type of jobs that'll, that'll fuel U.S. manufacturing going forward are not what they were 50 years ago. And I think the average person thinks that 
they're, they're still the same old type of, uh, type of work, and that's changed dramatically. That's a great point, Todd. So I look forward to that. And secondly, where can people find the new Thomas podcast? Tell us a little bit about that. Hey, thanks very much. So one of the things, in, and uh, you've been an inspiration for us in this area, is we're finding as we engage with leaders around our industry, we're having these fascinating conversations and trying to figure out how we could share that in a, in a way that's actionable, practical, and, and at times, Bob, inspiring. We just thought podcast is the best, uh, best you know, alternative for us in that regard. So we have a, a, the Thomas uh, Industry Update daily newsletter, which if someone goes to thomasnet.com slash update, they'll see the sign up for that. Um, every other week, our podcast will be contained in that. And you can also go to Apple or Google or any of the sources where you uh, regularly access uh, podcasts and we're in all the approved stores there. It is free. And, and would love people to uh, subscribe and also uh, give us feedback on, on what they're hearing, but also uh, people they'd like us to, to interview going forward. It's no need to tell you, it's turned out to be a fantastic format to, to help people hear stories because we learn by hearing stories. And I think particularly we've been um, so thrilled to, you know, our first, is, uh, first interview is with a woman named Ann Evans, who's a director with the Department of Commerce helping U.S. companies understand the complexities of exporting. And, and to hear the stories from Anne about the company she works with and how this works and you know, how she engages with them is just absolutely fascinating and, and very inspiring as well. And Tony, uh, final detail in the spirit of tell them, tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you just told them. What's the name of your podcast? It is called the Thomas Industry Update Podcast. Excellent. And uh, you can access it via thomasnet.com and also through the daily email newsletter, uh, the Thomas Industry Update. Wonderful. Well, uh, Mr. Uphoff, as always, thank you so much. Great hearing about Uphoff on industry and what's happening there. And always a pleasure, Tony. Likewise, Bob. Great to see you. Thanks very much. I'll see you next month. Tony, great. And thanks to all of you for being with us here on Cloud Wars Live. Tune in again sometime soon for our next installment of what's happening here in the digital revolution and the profound changes that are taking place around the world. Thanks for joining us.